David Bentley. I'm currently Vice President and Chief Scientist at Illumina. I was born in Windsor, uh, England, uh, 1958, uh, under the eaves of the, uh, the castle. My parents, uh, at the time, my father was working in the theatre. Uh, he was a musical director at the Theatre Royal Windsor, and my mother was a biology teacher. There, there was. I think my mother started it off um, because she was actually in Cambridge at the time of certainly the protein, uh, structural protein work that was going on. And she knew some of the people involved, Dorothy Hodgkin and so on, and she had uh, knew of uh, many of the people who were really developing that field. So she started me off. She knew some of the people who were writing popular articles uh, that I was reading. Um, but I'd also single out a biology teacher at high school, uh, my secondary school, uh, which uh, uh, ironically called Watson, no known relation. Um, but Ian Watson was a tremendous, passionate, enthusiastic man. And he had the benefit of almost a whole year off curriculum. Uh, we were able to be taught whatever he felt like talking us, uh, teaching us. So, uh, so he taught us a lot about molecular biology. And, uh, and also about the, the whole convergence of, of, of genetic inheritance with the molecular basis of it and the chromosomal basis of inheritance. It was clearly one of his pet topics and I just lapped it up. I loved it. So there are many people, too many to tell or even remember, but uh, Cambridge is a wonderful time for me. Um, I read Natural Sciences, uh, which really provides a blend, uh, including chemistry in particular. Uh, and, and my links to the chemistry department, of course, became uh, very important for later on. Um, but really, uh, one of the tremendous tutors there, David Hankey, who was in uh, my uh, college, Jesus College, um, really was a tutor to me throughout the time. It was a lucky break. He was teaching me for much of the first two years. Uh, and that one-to-one that -one or one-to-two tutorial was a, a feature of the Cambridge system that really allowed us to explore areas, in this case, of biology. Uh, and, and to really pursue our passions together. And he was a tremendous guiding, uh, guiding light in that. Then I went on to biochemistry. That was my final year subject, um, and uh, a tremendous course, uh, which uh, uh, really gave me a broad view of biochemistry without too much specialization, I think. Genetics wasn't a particularly strong feature of that course, but we'd had a lot of genetics already. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that was really the, the, the basis for my degree. Uh, it was a three-year degree, really rather short uh, by today's standards and I certainly uh, uh, by the age of 21 I was uh, considering my next step. <laughs> so my first uh, PhD year was up at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Uh, it was in Fred Sanger's division, Protein Nucleic Acid Chemistry. Uh, wonderful time to be there, 1979-1980. Um, and uh, it was just at the time when uh, uh, the whole concept, first of all, being in an environment that simply pursued technology. Uh, they really were less interested in the biological problems. Uh, George Brownlee had been Fred's first PhD student, I think, um, and so I was one of George's PhD students, so continuing the lineage. Um, and I had the pleasure both of working with George directly, um, and George was a great innovator. He liked to do different, he liked to do something no one else was doing. Uh, he'd spent a lot of time working on RNA sequencing in his earlier days, and that innovative and adventurous spirit showed through in this remarkably quiet uh, uh, but, but enthusiastic man, um, and his enthusiasm just came through. And so he encouraged me to do something very different as well, and uh, tackled a, probably in hindsight, pretty impossible problem to solve. Uh, and I was left to explore and to learn from many, any of the people in the laboratory of molecular biology which is a tremendous environment for me. Fred is a remarkable man, was a remarkable man. Um, he's quiet, uh, a quiet presence in the LMB. Um, great to see him uh, uh, strolling down the corridor every morning to get his ice from the ice bucket, ice machine, and go back to his lab. And he was also the holder of the all-important P32, uh, the uh, P32, the ATP, which we used for all the sequencing. And you had to go to Fred's lab to collect your aliquot of P32. And uh, certainly on occasion, I would see him standing there. There's a photograph, in fact, of him, which is just like how I remember him, standing there with his red cardigan on, uh, staring at the nautoradiograph that, to his apparent surprise, had really worked rather well. Uh, and Fred was a very modest man, but of course, at the same time, very quiet, very thoughtful, and very direct, actually, in the way he talked. And it was a pleasure to, to, to get to know Fred, uh, to talk to Fred.
Um, and, and I had a number of connections with Fred later on, of course, because later on Fred actually did come to the Sanger Centre. He blessed it, allowed us to use his name. Uh, and, and even more recently, George Brownlee actually was writing his, his biography. Um, so small world, uh, we came together again and uh, George actually uh, uh, asked for some help with, uh, with a chapter in the, in the book. Mm. Um, and then of course that all came to a head when Fred died. And so the biography really became very timely uh, and, and was published shortly afterwards. Uh, so it's wonderful really to still be there and to, to have a chance to perhaps acknowledge and reflect on Fred's enormous contributions in a very quiet way, in, in a personal way as well as, of course, all the scientific achievement that, that Fred really brought to the whole field. He was a great mentor and guide, as, as well as a tremendous scientist. Yes, yeah, so after a year, George Brownlee was already actually about to leave the LMB and set up at the Dunn School of Pathology in Oxford, so my PhD got transferred to an Oxford DPhil, uh, and uh, four of us, including George, uh, was a small nuclear group that moved across from the LMB to Oxford, and, and we set up the lab. And that was a remarkable experience, uh, very enjoyable. Um, we really had to do everything, including borrowing equipment and driving it over to, to Oxford to set up the lab. And the LMB were very helpful and supportive of George in setting up. So we had a chance to really just set up a lab from empty to doing the first Sanger dideoxy sequences in the Oxford uh, lab some two months later, which was a uh, a sign of success of the transfer that we were able to transfer what at the time was a fairly uh, sensitive uh, protocol, a uh, fairly complex protocol. Um, but it was, a, it, was, it was a great time. Yeah. And that was actually the same time uh, that Fred Sanger was awarded his Nobel Prize. And it was a very curious moment. I was actually driving back from Oxford to Cambridge on the day that and I heard the news on the radio that Fred had just been awarded a Nobel Prize for sequencing, so this was along with um, um, uh, Maxwell Gilbert as well. And, um, and uh, I got to the LMB and I couldn't believe it, of course, the lab was completely empty. I almost thought, it's not a weekend, what's happening here? The lab was completely empty. Nobody was in any of the floors of the laboratory. I thought, this is strange. And of course, sure enough, they were all crammed into the canteen up on the fourth floor. Uh, and uh, rumour has it that Bart Burrell and one or two others had bought up the entire champagne supply from, from Cambridge and uh, it was being busily used to celebrate Fred's, uh, Fred's uh, uh, second Nobel Prize. Uh, it was a wonderful moment. Um, so the work in the Dunn School of Pathology certainly went back a long way, but I think covered many areas of cell biology, in particular Henry Harris, had, the, the director at the time, had, had, had put a great uh, contribution of cell biology to it. Uh, and so in that sense, there was a breadth of, of research going on in the Dunn School. Um, and like many things, I think in, in molecular biology, you come along with the technology, uh, and the question is how it will have an impact on the environment around you. Um, George in particular interacted not just with the Dunn School, um, but with the, the other departments close by as well, biochemistry in particular, um, and set up collaborations uh, where we, were, we had the chance to, to see how the molecular biology, the techniques, so cloning as well as sequencing, of course, was a predominant uh, technology at the time, and, and it had enormous universal applicability to many research problems, so there were great collaborations being set up. One of the very prominent partnerships which George formed was actually with the then professor of biochemistry, it was Rodney Porter, um, and who, of course, he ran a tremendous protein chemistry lab, and so there was a tremendous discipline and trying to understand proteins and characterize proteins through purifying them and characterizing them at the peptide level had been all the rage. Um, but it was getting more and more difficult because the proteins that remained to be discovered, of course, were in much smaller amounts, vanishingly small amounts, difficult to purify, difficult to know if you'd purified the right thing. Uh, and so to the protein chemistry lab, the excitement of extending the characterization of the proteins involved in immunochemistry, uh, which is Rodney Porter's particular interest, the complement proteins, suddenly became a, a, a ripe target for molecular biology to lend a hand and to start to find other ways of searching through the nucleic acid-based uh, approach to find these elusive uh, genes or messenger RNAs. And that spawned the whole field uh, in Oxford of eukaryotic molecular genetics, human molecular genetics, uh, through George's lab. George then attracted a number of visitors, 
<coughs> uh, who were, were very influential, particularly people who were involved in haemophilia, haemophilia B. And so George embarked on a, a pretty extensive program to, to clone the factor IX gene. Um, and, uh, and that was a successful approach, um, uh, and others after it. And, and on the back of that experience, that pioneering experience of how to get a, a gene cloned from a little bit of protein information, uh, was something which was replicated time and time again. And so that was the basis for much of the characterization of the complement proteins a few years uh, after that, or perhaps only a year after that. Uh, and, and so I was working then, uh, well, I transferred then from, from George's lab at the end of my DPhil to work directly with Rodney Porter uh, and to continue that, that, that uh, gradual uh, dissemination of the molecular biology techniques from one department to another. Uh, so the biochemistry department and the and the Dunn School were a tremendous axis of collaboration in, in Oxford, something which I enjoyed for a number of years. So I guess I should put a couple of things together. I'll say one more thing about George and Rod and the contrast, which is a fascinating one. Because I'd mentioned already, George, George was very much the, the innovative, tried to do something different. Rodney actually uh, was was almost the, on the other on the other extreme. Rodney believed in doing the obvious. If there was a job to do, you should get it done. Um, and you should not hesitate, you should not try to think of the less obvious experiment, but you just march over the ground uh, and, and characterize things. And, and we did. We hit a seam with molecular genetics, human genes, uh, and we, we did a great deal. And it, it, it taught a great deal about the productivity that you could actually engender by developing a field and really working with it and expanding the applications and collaborating more and more widely. And that was an interesting contrast in, in, in the style of work uh, to, to George. Both are incredibly valuable and incredibly valuable training. Um, it was still in George's lab, both before and after I, I moved. Um, George had attracted not only some of the key people involved in haemophilia and one or two other uh, medical genetic uh, subjects, um, but in particular there were two people who both joined George on sabbatical um, for a year um, in George's lab. Um, uh, one was Ted Friedman uh, from UCSD, who was very interested in gene therapy. He'd known George for a long time, I think, and, and Ted was a wonderful mentor. He was really a great guy to have around uh, and, and really uh, took some time with us to, uh, to, to teach us something of what he thought about where things were going. The other was Francesco Gianelli. Uh, a haematologist uh, from Guy's Hospital in London, and he was my next boss, uh, though I didn't know it at the time. Um, and he, in particular, both of them actually collaborated very closely with uh, with the lady who then became my wife. Uh, so I met my wife in the same laboratory as well, and my wife was also working on haemophilia B. Uh, and so together, there were projects that increasingly became relevant to patients, and the move from uh, the the appetite to find the gene through knowledge of the protein, moved from, well, now we have the gene, now we can really get access to the genetics. And uh, of course, the genetics really involved, this is a means to uh, identify mutations in conditions. And that's where really George and Francesco, um, uh, in particular, uh, with others, Charles Ritzer in Oxford, um, and um, uh, set up uh, the suggestion that they would collect DNA samples from haemophilia B patients and actually characterize them at the DNA level to search for mutations which were involved in the cause of haemophilia B. Uh, and that was really, for me, that began to, it, it began to open my eyes to some of this, the medical aspects of it. Because Francesco was a, a haematologist, uh, he worked in a pediatric research unit uh, in Guy's Hospital. Uh, certainly when I got talking to him rather more, it became rather more uh, obvious that this was a whole new direction uh, to, of research uh, to, to, to go in. Well, yeah, the Human Genome Project, um, not by name, for three or four years more, I think. Uh, I guess I heard about it when I'd already moved to Guy's. 1986 was a very important uh, uh, year for me, uh, when really I began to hear more about the discussions of the Human Genome Project. But the concept of mapping and characterizing human chromosomes was actually rather earlier. 
Um, and uh, in looking back just recently, um, I, I've, I've reckoned a few times there was a, a project way back during my first postdoc uh, with Rod Porter, uh, where um, we actually uh, mapped four of the, the complement class three genes together in a small contig. But at the time, it was a huge effort to assemble a small contig of four cosmids that overlapped, that were shown to overlap, and, and they identified uh, this cluster of four genes. Uh, and, and that was the, the nature of physically mapping out in cloned DNA to try to replicate or reproduce uh, the, uh, the pattern of the genes as they actually sat in the chromosome. And, and this, for me, was, was really it was so, it's something you could almost feel physically. It was actually characterizing something that you could definitely prove to be right. Um, interestingly, it was never the complete picture. There was always more to discover. Um, but that was my first contribution to a rather rapid coming together of a contig of clones to map genes, to begin to understand something which really nobody had had a concept of distance along a chromosome before. And from that, this is where Ted Freeman and Francesco Ginelli and George all come in again. They started from sitting on the factor IX gene and actually the factor VIII gene next to it, which George was involved in for a while, um, to, to actually, again, asking the question, well, could, could we link up genes on the X chromosome? Of course, the X chromosome was particularly uh, an exciting chromosome because of all the genetic diseases that were known to be associated with the X chromosome. Uh, the hemizygous nature of the male really immediately manifested, uh, meant that in, in males recessive conditions immediately manifested themselves. And so haemophilia B and haemophilia A were only two of many X-linked diseases. Um, so, uh, so suddenly the idea of, of taking this whole concept of mapping rather further, linking genes up, and then perhaps being able to search in the material in between uh, and to really begin to capitulate the linear nature of DNA and its ability to code along an entire chromosome uh, and to start to map back the, the, the concept of linkage at the molecular level. This, this, this is my exciting year at school all over again, um, the ability to start characterizing the unknown. Marching through it is what Rodney Porter had taught me. Uh, don't think too hard about it, just do it. Um, and that was an exciting uh, moment. So that was really where the idea of mapping genes and looking, really taking advantage of the say linear continuity of DNA, walking along the chromosomes in some fashion, uh, took root. So this, I think, was somewhat before the Human Genome Project was properly uh, uh, defined. Uh, but nevertheless, the concept was there. And I'm sure many people around the world were having experiences like this. Uh, and so when the concept of the Human Genome Project was vocalized, formalized, uh, it made a lot of sense. The geneticists, I mean, were branding people with particular qualities, which I'm sure that it's not really true. Um, but if, if an individual, let's say, has been working on the genetics of a particular disease, which involves a particular gene, then that's one thing. Uh, and they rapidly go down the medical route of understanding or seeking to characterize the genetics of the disease. But when you broaden the field to applying the concept of what you know a lot about in terms of a gene and a disease and the mutations that may cause it, you recognize instantly that that can be applied to any genetic disease, and probably many we don't even know are genetic. It becomes a universal principle. Uh, principle. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's where genomics actually helps. So genomics is not there to steal the uh, genetics from the geneticists. Um, genomics is there to really help and support uh, and, 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 and make genetics much more accessible to many more diseases, many more patients. Um, and, and to provide a, a, a much uh, streamlined process uh, for, for characterizing the molecular genetics of disease. Um, so I wouldn't claim to have been doing genomes before the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project was a wonderful description of the, of the, of the concepts, the isolated events, the examples which I had seen, and suddenly it came together. Um, another very important element in all this, which, which also on the one hand, there's the human genetics that makes the interest and the utility of the human genome sequence potentially so important. The promise of the Human Genome Project is that it will help and revolutionize genetics and, and, and medicine. But it was also the work on other genomes, 
uh, that was more advanced, that wasn't motivated by human genetics, but it was nevertheless motivated by the same idea of, 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 of characterizing a complete organism at the genetic level. Uh, and here particularly, and I would pick out the nematode worm, um, uh, because that's when I, I... I didn't really know John from when I was at the LMB, but I did get to know John when I, uh, shortly after I arrived in London. Uh, and I was just beginning to absorb the genetics of X-linked disease at Guy's Hospital and become immersed in that. But I was also there uh, actually on purpose to do research on areas that could not be funded from other sources. That was the terms of the Generation Trust, a private trust fund which was funding my research. Um, and so that's where chromosome mapping was really one of the things to try to get our, our teeth into back in uh, 1985, I guess this was. Um, and I went along to a London Molecular Biology Club seminar, and there were three talks at it. Um, Bob Williamston, John Solston, and Peter Little. And they all talked about the same thing, in the sense that they talked about establishing contigs of clones that represented different organisms. Uh, John, of course, in particular, uh, was talking about the, the worm genome and their work in beginning to assemble contigs of clones to characterize the complete genome. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, I don't know this, but I, I anticipate anyway that John's interest was always to characterize everything about a living system. John had previously, and he told me on, on, on more than one occasion, the happiest time of his life was sitting in a tiny room with a microscope at one end, actually staring all day and mapping out the lineage of cells in the nematode. And of course, he eventually I believe, established the complete lineage of cells in the nematode, as well as discovering uh, phenomena like apoptosis and so on, or programmed cell death, as it was originally, I think, coined, the, the term was coined. Um, but again, the idea that you, we have done that, so the next thing I do, I'm also going to have an appetite to try to cover the whole thing. And, and that was clearly behind John's motivation. And I loved that, the idea of doing the whole thing, getting the whole job done. Doesn't matter how long it takes, Maybe a lot of marching, but march through and do it, and don't stop until you've done it. Um, and one of the other important influences was Maynard, Maynard Olson. I met Maynard again fairly early on in my time at uh, Guy's, um, and there, there are two or three threads where I met Maynard, but this particular one was when he came to Guy's Hospital to a course, a Wellcome Trust Advanced Genomics? No, Advanced Genetics course. I can't remember the name of it now. Welcome to us Advanced Courses, anyway. And this particular one, uh, three of us were teaching genomics, uh, the technology, um, to various people who are very keen to, to start it. And Maynard was one of the uh, keynote seminar speakers. And after the uh, talk, we ended up drinking beer in Guy's Hospital somewhere, in one of the older parts of the hospital. And he said in his view that the yeast mapping project, which had been going along in parallel to the nematode mapping project, Maynard and John knew each other very well, he regarded it as a failure. And I said, why on earth do you think it's a failure? And Maynard said, well, there are six gaps, or however many there were. The idea was to get continuity, and I, I, I couldn't close the gaps. I hadn't closed the gaps. He was missing stuff. And it was a bit like, well, it was very like the approach that John Solston was taking to looking at the whole problem, and until you've done it, you haven't succeeded. But Maynard was rather more purist about it. Um, and I said to Maynard at the time, well, um, I don't agree with you. Maybe the job isn't finished in terms of continuity, but look at all the stuff you have done. Look at the value that's in the 99 or so percent that you've got. And I think I said at that moment, I mean, if, if I had a human genome that had a few gaps in it, I'd still be pretty happy with the, with the outcome. And uh, I mean, I thought about it, and I don't think he necessarily commented on that much, but, uh, but clearly it was, it was an interesting concept and, and a very good one to try to motivate to get complete continuity, not to stop. And of course, the yeast genome, um, the worm genome, and the human genome in particular still has gaps. There's no question. And those gaps become a point of debate. Um, both of the ones in the euchromatic sequence. The odd percent? What's a one percent? Well, actually, that's one hundredth of all the genes, maybe. 
And then, of course, we don't necessarily usually refer to the to the heterochromatic regions and those things which are almost completely uncharacterized. Right. So completeness uh, is, is, is certainly a relative term. Um, and, uh, and so the concept of Maynard and John striving hard to really get the job done and complete it was an important one and probably drove both my understanding of, of just how determined you have to be, how much you have to slog through, uh, and how much you have to be looking very hard at methods that seek to achieve the goal, but don't actually look encouraging when you, when you look at them close up. There were, there were methods that were published that really were claiming long-range continuity, but there were shortcomings. And you have to look very hard and critically, self-critically uh, often, to, to actually try to um, adhere to, to the concept of doing a really good job and ultimately faithfully representing a piece of DNA in its entirety in some immortalized form, whether cloned biologically or ultimately, of course, sequenced and stored as information. Maynard's a great thinker and a great communicator. And he thinks both very clearly, not too much in the detail, but he will certainly try to see right through a problem from basic principles and I think try to create something. I think very individually create something almost from scratch. Um, he will not spend too much time basing his own ideas on other people's theories necessarily. He really will certainly question other background information, other theories, and really build something from scratch. And I think that, that there's a purity in there and a clarity, which is, is tremendous. He's also a great communicator because he will evolve a whole um, uh, theory, uh, strategy, or whatever, uh, almost without pause. You can sit and listen for 20 minutes and you learn a huge amount uh, and he never really deviates uh, from, from the subject in hand. Um, and uh, it, it's clear that he just has absorbed a huge amount of background and perspective to enable him to see clearly and to concentrate on the important things in his mind and I think I agree with pretty much everything he thought, thought about. Um, and it's a tremendous um, synergy that, that I felt, or, or respect for his approach, um, because I fell into his way of thinking quite easily. It was easy to follow the thread. There was a strong thread there, there was logic, um, uh, and it was, it was, say, very easy to, to, to follow Maynard's thinking. Um, also a great philosopher, um, particularly on the science, and if, if you've seen Maynard quite often, I think, gets given the task of summing up an entire conference. And he goes around getting opinions from everybody, and, and just in three days, he not only managed to absorb all this new information that's coming out of the conference in a very concentrated fashion, but to somehow distill it down into some very clear messages and some very strong messages, and to communicate them at the end of the conference. Uh, and that's a remarkable capability. Yeah. He's also very hard to put off. Um, because on one occasion when I think uh, he was doing the summing up, I think it was a conference that Eric and I were organizing, um, but um, actually the lights went out in the middle of Maynard's summing up and apart from a quick quip and pausing, he simply carried on uh, and uh, the clarity and, and, and the drive to get to the end of his point was, was absolutely crystal, crystal clear. In the years just coming up to the Sanger Center, I. Uh, uh, of course, I was following John Salston's work quite closely on the nematode worm. I was, again, very, very attracted by the global view of trying to do a complete job on the nematode worm at the molecular level. At the mapping level, this was. This was before sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, and I did actually meet John a few times and, and shared what I was trying to do with human DNA. And I was trying to really apply a lot of the technology uh, and lessons learned from the worm to mapping human chromosomes. And uh, we went further. We actually collaborated to start using C. elegans software tools, ACEDB in particular. It's when I met Richard Durbin. And so quite a lot of contacts were formed with John, and John was very aware of what, um, uh, what I was working on. Sometime later, he actually, when I actually published a paper on a very small piece of the X chromosome that I had managed to map both in yaks and in cosmids, uh, done by a, a student of, of mine, Jill Holland. And, uh, and he, uh, he actually confessed afterwards that, that he was very surprised when we got it to work. 
he didn't think we'd get it to work because of all the repeats in the human genome that prevented us from hybridizing from one level of the genome to uh, one level of the, of the reagents to another. Um, and I don't know how much that counted, but we did manage to get a great deal to work. We used his fingerprinting techniques, we used his filter-based hybridization uh, strategy, and, and, and employed it all on human chromosomes, on the X and on 22. Um, and uh, clearly we've been working quite closely with Richard Durbin for, I can't remember quite when it was, 1991, maybe 1990. And as it turns out, this was sort of about the time when uh, the, the whole, uh, the beginnings, the early foundations, or perhaps the seeds of the Sanger Center were sown. And the idea that both John and Bob, uh, Bob Waterston, needed to be given a foundation, a more secure foundation to work on the worm and on the sequencing of the, of the worm genome. Um, and so um, there was a remarkable moment when actually, uh, I, I, we actually were, hosting a visitor in Guy's Hospital at the time in my department, um, Kay Davies, uh, who was being hosted by Martin Bobrow, the head of the department, and uh, happened to be uh, in Francesco Gianelli's office, where I was as well, and so we were talking and the phone went. And um, Francesco picked up the phone and then passed on the call to me, because it was for me, and it was John Solston. And I wasn't really expecting a call from John, and John said, oh, hello, David. How are you? Are you well? Yes. And he said, well, I'll come straight to the point. He said, how would you like to come to Cambridge and join me in setting up an institute? And I froze um, because I felt that, well, Kay and Martin and Francesco surely had heard the entire conversation going on. Um, but it was a remarkable phone call. And we realized it was an another time we'd better to talk. Um, but, uh, uh, but that was the beginning of suddenly, of course, when something like that happens you suddenly feel the whole landscape change. Uh, and, and of course, the mind starts to work very fast on what the opportunity might be. It just changes all the, the, the conceptions, the, the pre, previous conceptions and previous thoughts. Um, and a very stimulating time. Um, uh, I was very happy at Guy's. I was doing a great deal with, uh, with human genetics at, at this point. Um, but clearly, this was another opportunity. Uh, perhaps a difficult decision, but clearly as time went on, in a relatively short space of time, it was clear this was a very big opportunity uh, and an opportunity to really uh, get much more involved in a very new venture, um, which really uh, uh, um, drew together many of the early experiences that I had. And so I think it was less than a year later, uh, the Sanger Centre grant was, was awarded um, and then moved uh, some six, nine months after that to to set up a, a group and to bring some people with me from guys who had been working on the X chromosome and chromosome 22. And that was the basis for the human uh, genome component of the Sanger program. Uh, so that's how we really got into the, the, the project. And I should say, as much of the pilot studies we'd done at guys were, were, were funded by the MRC, who'd set up a, a, a HGMP, a ring fenced program for funding small projects. But it was clear that if this job was going to be done, it needed a whole different scale of investment. And uh, I think both the MRC and the Wellcome Trust really worked together to make that happen and to create the Sanger Center. Um, so at that point, I think I was at least involved in, in, in genome projects. When the Sanger was first set up, it was actually set up to support John to sequence the worm and Bart Burrell, in fact, to sequence yeast. And I think it was more a question, and to work out how to tackle the human genome, what, what to do, how to contribute to the human genome. Um, and uh, it was, uh, I think, well, I think almost every year after that, there were ongoing discussions with the Wellcome Trust and proposals to, to continue and extend the program uh, and to really start working on the human genome. And I guess it was probably about a year after that uh, that we went for additional funding uh, and indeed the Wellcome Trust agreed that it was time to do more directly uh, and more direct work on actually working out how to and actually starting on sequencing uh, the human genome. And that was when the chromosome 22 and the X chromosome that had been going on for several years before it and had come up from guys, um, became uh, the center of the human genome program. Um, 
uh, along with a piece of chromosome 4, I recall, which had the Huntington's disease locus in it somewhere, though it hadn't been found before. I think there was no limitation in will. There was very definitely a will to do this. I think the two major limitations were probably, it was resource limited, it was funding limited, although the Wellcome Trust had been very generous, and I think, I think there was still a general, of, general sense of caution that actually it wasn't unanimously necessarily the right thing to do or to do it this way or was it going to cost too much and I think there was some, still some debate about should we be waiting for new technology uh, or perhaps the debate had happened and we'd moved on but of course not everybody had necessarily really satisfied themselves that the technology was ready and I think there were technology gaps clearly the sequencing was the technology that was chosen and that, that lasted, stood the test of time for the entire human genome but there were gaps um, and the yaks sort of came and went. Um, they weren't sufficiently stable to actually uh, 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 contain a faithful copy of the DNA within them, although they were quite good for a long-range continuity. Um, cosmids were too small, um, perhaps some levels of bias. So one of the important gaps that was then filled was that the pack and the back system. So that was that was missing at the beginning of the program, um, and uh, and that was an important transition, filled a really important gap. I think one of the other technology gaps uh, was actually a framework to independently verify, demonstrate, and even create the higher level order of contigs along a chromosome. Um, and this is where both, first of all, the genetic map, and certainly in the UK, uh, the, the, the eyes were on the European initiative in, in France, in the, the, the CEF laboratories in Geneton. Um, where Jean Weissenbach, of course, created a microsatellite-based map, uh, a very elegant piece of work that really provided a level of continuity, albeit the points were somewhat far apart, um, followed relatively quickly by the radiation hybrid mapping, uh, which was a very exciting uh, uh, time indeed, uh, where we actually went from being, having a system that could not only make use of non-polymorphic markers and many more of them and achieve higher densities, but they also could integrate the genetic markers as well because it was all PCR based. Uh, it was all STSs, a concept that Maynard and his colleagues had advanced. Um, and suddenly automating very high throughput PCR reactions to map out uh, a, a, a um, uh, a set of markers uh, much higher density than, than a genetic map. That really provided the density of markers needed along a chromosome to allow the clones to then take over. Uh, and we no longer needed yaks to provide the continuity. Uh, the distances could be filled with packs and backs. And of course, John Solston's fingerprinting method, which still really uh, enabled us to, to link clones together. Uh, and so we now suddenly had two approaches uh, orthogonal almost approaches to create the continuity that was so important. There was the fingerprinting of the backs and the packs to um, pr provide the, the, the continuity, but there was also the reference points from all the SDSs, uh, anchor points to actually uh, identify individual clones uh, underneath those markers. And if we needed more markers, we could now do them. We could generate more markers, do more PCR, uh, and actually add markers to the same map. Um, and, and that integration, that very close integration between the genetic, the radiation hybrid, and the clone maps uh, was a very important area. Two, two technology gaps filled in fairly quick succession uh, by the pioneering efforts of, of laboratories around the world. Radiation hybrid map famously brought together the David Cox lab and the Peter Goodfellow's uh, background. And of course the concept actually came in part, at least from Henry Harris in the Dunn School of Pathology some years earlier in constructing these mouse-human hybrids that became the, uh, the reagents that underpinned the radiation hybrid map. So those technology gaps were important to fill. They led to very constructive international collaborations. We were exploring how to collaborate, meeting the whole community through these efforts. Um, and that, I think, quite quickly uh, really stimulated the funding agencies probably to do more uh, and to consider that there was really was a coherent approach that was very step by step. Uh, the Human Genome Project must be the most step by step hierarchical study of any genome I think that's ever been done. Um, 
But that was partly because we were working every step out at, at one after another rather sequentially. We were relying on different techniques to try to tackle a very large problem. Um, and also, I think the community in general, and perhaps the funding agencies in particular, needed to see those levels of evidence, the levels of proof, the levels of being able to uh, obtain completion at different levels of resolution uh, to be confident of moving on to the next level. I think that was a, a fairly compelling element of, of the project uh, that enabled us quite quickly to move through the barriers and to confidently expand uh, the program. Clearly, the sequencing technology in multiple labs and within the Sanger, certainly uh, John himself and Jane Rogers took a very personal interest in, in putting the, uh, the technology providers through their paces. Uh, but, but the sequencing was really coming on a pace, I think. The, um, although it looked a little shaky to start with, the automation of the f the to get fluorescence detection uh, instead of radioactivity. I think some of the early nematode cosmids, uh, there was at least one person who was convinced that the right way to do it was still with radioactive sequencing. Uh, well, the, well, the first fluorescent machines were not really delivering so much, but it was the right thing to do. There's no question. Embracing a new technology, getting away from radioactivity, high level of automation. Right. Uh, they were absolute bellwethers for, for, for progress. I think it, it's interesting. I think from the very beginning, um, the sense that the human genome could be done um, from my perspective, anyway, it was based very much on the argument, well, the worm is 100 megabases, and that looks like it's going to get done. In fact, it was probably largely done by the time we came to this point. Um, and um, done to a highly uh, automated sequencing, but also finishing, and then all the hallmarks of a, a high-quality product were, were, were there. Um, and each human chromosome is about the size of, of, of a nematode genome. So all we have to do is divide the project up by 20 or so, and we have 20 nematode projects, and that seems to be really quite manageable. And that's it's one example of the philosophy of going chromosome by chromosome. Um, but I think it worked quite naturally because that's what people have been doing for some time. We'd been working on 22 and part of the X chromosome at Guy's Hospital. Um, and that illustrated two things. Uh, the reason that, that we chose chromosome 22 uh, was actually to get away from a busy chromosome where lots of people were working on different parts because, fine, we would all discuss and work out and some people were working on the same bits as others and we'd figure that out at some point. And I think Eric Green and I actually had a go at uh, suggesting that uh, as long as you went uh, stuck within your own gap between two SDSs, then we would actually carve up the entire genome STS by STS. Now, that never quite worked out. Um, and, uh, and instead, chromosomes were the much more logical currency. Um, so we moved to chromosome 22 because it was essentially almost unstudied at genome level anyway. Um, it was also small, so continuity and finishing the map was going to be much quicker than the, than the X or an average size chromosome. Uh, and at some 33 uh, uh, meg megabases, of course, was only a third the size of the worm genome. So things were starting to look up uh, that we could actually make progress quite quickly. Um, and, and so between those two examples, chromosome 22, we were simply looking at the whole thing. The X chromosome, bigger chromosome, popular chromosome, brought with it its problems, both in terms of size and the complexity of the community. Uh, and so those two models rather played out for the whole genome, I think. And others were doing, I think, following probably exactly the same logic. Uh, David Cox and Rick Myers were interested in chromosome 4 because of an early interest in certain genes on it, I think. Uh, chromosome 6 uh, and others. Um, and, and so gradually, the, the splitting up of the genome organizationally into chromosomes, reflecting the, the natural uh, interest of different laboratories uh, was, was how I think it really took place. And I do recall one or two meetings where we got together quite quickly at the beginning of one coordination meeting to, to, to try to divvy up the chromosomes between the groups. And it kind of worked quite well because most groups were actually working on different chromosomes. And there were one or two, two debates and the X chromosome was always going to be more of a mosaic. Uh, but some of the others were, were more straightforward and alliances were formed. People began to realize if they were all part of something bigger, uh, 
and actually you had a chance to look at the horizon for the whole genome, then, then it made much more sense to try and get the whole job done than to fight over one chromosome. And so I think the idea of splitting it up between chromosomes worked very well and worked for, at, a, at a particular meeting. There was a very definite agreement to, to work on certain chromosomes. And this was about, I'm not sure, 95 or 96. I would say 95, but I'd, I'd have to check on that. Um, it coincided with the Wellcome Trust agreeing to fund the Sanger for more. And so that's when we started chromosome 6. Um, and uh, within a week, we had a chromosome 6 team. It was astonishing. We took people from 22 and from the X team and formed the chromosome 6 team. And we suddenly were able to expand onto another chromosome and clearly illustrated the scalability of the whole program at the human level as well as at the technology level. Um, one of the very things that happened at that time, so Wellcome Trust had funded us for a sixth of the genome and the other members of the G5 and, and other labs as well were funded to varying degrees for other chromosomes. And I once drew up a poster which summarized, I boxed each of the chromosomes in colors to represent each of the people contributing it. And about a third of the chromosomes were not assigned. And uh, we had a royal visit at the Sanger. Princess Anne came to visit the Sanger and I think officially opened a building. Um, and, uh, and, and she walked down the corridor and I had this poster up on the wall and she actually stopped to say hello. And Princess Anne is not a geneticist, she's not a biologist, um, but like other members of the royal family, they're, they're, they're very perceptive, they know the questions to ask. And so she looked at this diagram and she said, um, who's going to take responsibility for the other ones? And that was such a good question <laughs> to ask, because of course <laughs> it was exactly the right question. Uh, and of course it was eventually the question that got resolved, uh, maybe a year later or less than a year later, when suddenly everything scaled up to the concept of, we need to do the whole genome, we need to do it now, we need to have a strategy now, what's the strategy? We need to make sure there aren't any parts of the genome that aren't covered. And then I think the chromosome by chromosome strategy really did expand, more resources became available, the Sanger funded, uh, was, was funded for now up to a third of the genome. Um, and at the same time, I think the NIH must have done a, a lot to to, to really stimulate that. The DOE, I think, came in possibly more firmly, so everything happened at, uh, at about that time. Well, I think it's important to say that the G5 didn't do the entire genome. Right. There were contributions, small and large. Um, and I think that was a very important concept. And I think the, the, the simple solution to it is that if you release your data and you share your data in some standardized, coordinated fashion, then it is clear that you are working and contributing to the whole, and it makes no sense to duplicate. And so in that sense, a small group can survive under certain precepts like being coordinated and being transparent and, and, and showing and sharing their contributions. Uh, clearly, the question of scale and, 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 and being able to make economies of scale is very important, and that's inevitably a driving force. Uh, the, the, this may have been a, a decent level of automation around the sequencing, but there was still a huge amount of potential economy of scale as a result of really building dedicated teams and dedicated uh, laboratories that really uh, did this. Sanger was like that. Sanger was working on two and sometimes three shifts a day. Uh, and that was not something a small lab was going to, to necessarily keep up. So inevitably, um, there was a question of, of cost overall. But I think it's, I'm delighted the small, smaller labs, the labs that contributed smaller parts of the sequence, did stay and contribute um, because they added a great deal, I think, in other ways to, to, to the project. And of course, one of the latest and most recent members of the consortium, China, uh, came in late to the game, um, but contributed some sequence to the program. And of course, the, 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 the outcome of China becoming part of the Human Genome Project, of course, had huge ramifications right. for, for the future uh, in a very global way. And I think uh, uh, clearly if, if, if that had not become possible and if they hadn't been welcomed to the community, uh, then, then uh, uh, the world and, and, and the Chinese sequencing uh, community would be the poorer for it or uh, would possibly not have evolved. And one of the very interesting things that the, that the community tested out, somewhat before the G5, back in the first Bermuda meeting in, in, in 96, was the decision to create this framework, 
of data sharing, transparency, uh, and to begin to set standards about what was being generated. Um, but the data release policy demanded that the requirements of the project um, were put ahead of the constraints of individual nations or laboratories. And that was a hard decision for some people to take. And I think one or two people actually couldn't, that they had to go back to their national constraints, uh, their, their, their governments, and, and decide whether they could participate yeah. or not. And, and uh, but achieving that transparency, that sharing, really formed the basis for, 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 for setting a common standard. And that's when both large and small groups could participate as long as the standards were set uh, and the necessary constraints were, were, were met. I think people were always talking about SNPs to some extent during the, and before the program, sure. um, really. Um, SNPs, any, any type of variation, certainly this, uh, uh, whether it was an RFLP or, or, or not, um, was very important in genetics. Um, uh, so in that sense, it was always being talked about. I think the concept um, of scaling up clearly became possible. I think it, it, it was starting to get talked about before the genome was assembled. Um, that, that's certainly the case. Um, there's a fascinating transition. Once, once the concept had been established that it was a really good idea to, 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 to develop a SNP map uh, of, of, of the genome or to collect a large number of SNPs for the genome, uh, I guess it embraced the idea that here we were being able to look genome-wide. Uh, here we were, the concept perhaps of the STS uh, had, had was really, again, uh, um, uh, providing some momentum to, to the idea of being able to spread markers right across a genome and the power of doing so at an ever higher density. Uh, plus the fact that there were ways of doing it through sequencing. And sequencing was now much easier to do um, at scale. Uh, and suddenly that was not the limitation. Uh, only six, seven years earlier, sequencing had been an impossible cost-limited element to doing an experiment. And suddenly sequencing was a currency you could work with uh, and generate large amounts of sequence data from other individuals, compare them to each other uh, and later on to the genome to actually identify variations systematically at speed the fascinating transitions happened during the SNP consortium, and we're skipping over the SNP consortium a little bit here mm -hmm. into, into the early part of the experimental strategy. But when we first started the SNP consortium, um, the, the centers that contributed to, to it, um, we started on an approach that did not assume the existence of the genome sequence. We started on a process where experimentally we targeted specific subsets of the genome uh, uh, in a genome-wide fashion. So we would simply take restriction fragments of a certain size, which were scattered throughout the genome, um, but they sampled a very small subset of the genome, and we generated SNPs across those regions. Um, and a little while later, um, the draft genome sequence was being accumulated all the time, and it suddenly became possible to essentially not just compare all the sequences to each other in the defined regions that we had created, but also to look right across the genome. One read was suddenly enough to call a SNP uh, because it could be aligned to this wonderful free and available draft genome sequence. And variants could be called all over the genome with much greater efficiency. Um, and so then I think the whole question of developing a, a dense SNP map became much more a reality. Yes, yeah, so I was quite involved in the SNP consortium. They're probably not actually at the beginning. I think at, at the very beginning, there was a, clearly a series of discussions, probably founded from these various meetings to discuss the importance of variation. The recognition, perhaps, of variation was very important, not just to genomes and genetics, but to pharma companies as well. So there clearly was an interest in variation within uh, the, the, the pharma companies. Um, and I think there had already been some individual investments in individual companies to try to address the problem of, uh, of getting a, a reliable, comprehensive set of variants uh, to actually uh, answer questions about genetic predispositions, variability of drug response, whatever it might be. Um, and so it must have been at, at least a year, I think, that there was this tremendous negotiation going on between pharma companies, um, orchestrated, I think, largely by Alan Williamson, uh, 
who was another friend and mentor of mine. Um, and Alan must have spent, I think, at least 12 months working on putting together this idea of, of, of the SNP consortium, uh, of developing both a, both a public-private partnership and also um, uh, persuading or, or encouraging the pharma companies to agree that this particular resource of collecting information, collecting variants, could be considered pre-competitive. And, and, and that was a really important element of, of the program, which actually enabled people to agree that, yes, A, we can't do this alone. B, there's little point in 10 or 11 companies doing the same thing. So let's pool our resources and do it much more systematically in a much more organized fashion and agree that it is a pre-competitive space. Uh, and from that moment on, I think the concept of the pre-competitive uh, space, of course, then drew on the concept of rapid data release, being able to share the information, different laboratories working to a common standard, a common set of standards for, for the quality of the calls and the uh, methods for verifying. Indeed, there was something of a round robin, not quite a round robin, there, there was something of a verification process anyway. Uh, for, for the SNP calling to, to ensure the quality of the resource was both standardized and, and, and high quality. Um, so this was the point at which moving from the early negotiations to establish the, uh, uh, the, 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 the governance and the guidelines of the consortium to actually getting the job done. And that was, of course, when the, the academic labs uh, uh, were approached. Um, so Sanger uh, and uh, Washington University uh, and, uh, and the Whitehead Institute, as it was at the time, uh, were, were certainly approached as, as, as if, if we were provided funding from such a consortium, how would we approach to do it? And I think, I think largely independently, two of us at least, if not all of us, came up with similar ideas or the same ideas for an approach. And that lent some conviction to the idea that uh, we could all work within our own laboratory organisations but contribute variants of a common standard that were distributed across the genome as a whole. Well, SNPs can be used in many different ways, of course, and uh, essentially using SNPs for linkage analyses and pedigrees. They have a lot of power over a lot of distance because there are relatively few crossovers that are informative in terms of identifying or finding a way around the genome and, and, and inherited um, uh, um, phenotypes within a particular pedigree. Um, but a much higher density of, of SNPs, essentially, that the target of the, the SNP consortium, of course, was stated as 300,000. I'm not sure how much that was genetic theory and how much that was budget limited, um, but 300,000 was a stated goal. It was a good density, an average density of SNPs to go for, uh, and clearly did uh, match uh, the ability to start measuring linkage disequilibrium in, in populations. Um, and this was a start of something much bigger. I think it's, it was always going to be true, the more SNPs you have, the better you could characterize genomes with the, 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 using the linkage to equilibrium in different populations. Um, and um, uh, from my perception, the fields evolved somewhat in parallel. People were working with small regions, or in our case, chromosome. We were looking at LD on chromosome 22 with, with a set of SNPs. Uh, and, and we clearly recognized that calibrated uh, the, uh, the density of the map at one level. But others, Alec Jeffries in particular, is working at very high density in a very small region of, of the genome and, and demonstrating crossovers and demonstrating the ability to really characterize very, uh, in very fine detail uh, the pattern of recombination in, in, in populations. So clearly, the denser the maps, the more valuable the, the, the resource would be. So I think, from my perspective, I was largely involved in data generation uh, for, for, for the actual SNP collections. Um, two things happened. Um, one quite early on in, in, in the TSC, uh, which is when I've already described to some extent the fact that actually we could make much greater use of the data we had by incorporating the genome. And essentially almost overnight we could quadruple the number of SNPs that we had in the same resource. Um, so clearly by now the whole concept of collecting SNPs, mapping SNPs, using the draft genome that was getting better and better all the time, uh, of course, really changed the game in terms of what we could do to generate a, a good resource. Um, and at the beginning of the HapMap project, or slightly before the beginning of the HapMap project, um, uh, one of the questions surrounding it, I remember David Altshuler and Tom Hudson, myself, Mark Daly, one or two others, met uh, early one year, 
uh, and, and, and discussed the possibilities. Um, one of the elements was actually generating more SNPs, uh, higher density. And at this point, we were able to once again actually take a chromosome by chromosome approach and flow sort more chromosomes and sequence them and align them to the draft genome. This was again getting easier. The currency of sequencing was yielding more and more, more efficiently. So one of the elements of the hat map was the recognition that with all the pilot studies and measurements of LD having been carried out, we began to think to, to get a better idea of the number of SNPs that were required or the benefits of more SNPs. And so SNP generation was actually a first part of the HapMap project as well. Um, and uh, was pretty much being done at the time we published the, uh, um, the, the principles of the HapMap project, uh, kind of before it started in, in earnest, but at the same time we were already generating more SNPs in preparation uh, for, for, for the HapMap project. Well, I think, I think um, much of the leadership of the HapMap consortium again um, came from Francis. I think Francis took a very uh, prominent hand in, in organizing and particularly ensuring the, the involvement of, of so many people, I, both who had been involved before and those who were newcomers to it, both large and small. Um, this was the first consortium that worked closely, I think, with Yusuke Nakamura, and Japan was really very much part of this, the single biggest contributor to the first phase of HapMap. That was a very exciting and, and uh, stimulating uh, um, entry into the, the community. Uh, and I also remember a, a very large meeting here in Washington, uh, I, think, uh, I think the Renaissance Hotel or something, um, um, where uh, actually, there are members of every possible community and participant and skill set all, all gathered in this room to really explore over a day and a half, I think it was, what this project was, what it meant. Um, and uh, um, many different population representatives were present and lots of uh, discussion was had, both outlining what the project would be and um, how it affected people, how it affected populations, how it affected society. Uh, and the impact it could have uh, on, uh, on ultimately on population genetics and disease. Yeah, I think pretty early on, I don't know what stimulated actually, but I do remember early on, I think a number of us felt very keen on sampling different ethnic groups, um, certainly to pick from Asia, certainly to pick in Africa. I also remember a discussion that then went from that to deciding, and Eric Lander was on the call at this point as well, but a call where we agreed, uh, Eric and myself and, and, and several others, I think, um, that we really needed to go to the indigenous populations to actually collect the samples. While it was much more difficult, it added a whole level of difficulty to the project compared to utilizing an African American group, or a, a, you know, a European group, which was which is already a research cohort or something, um, but to go to indigenous populations, uh, for me, felt very important from the point of view of um, um, going back to the source. Um, the Africans are in Africa, uh, but of course, very much also important. It, it globalized the whole project. It engaged communities in a way that was at once very challenging. Um, because here were communities who'd never heard of HapMap, uh, didn't necessarily know what the benefit was, um, and so the idea of contributing uh, freely to a consortium, um, uh, they needed to work a lot of that out uh, as part of the engagement. And it was a fascinating process. I wasn't very involved in the engagement. I was involved in, in one engagement process in particular with the, a tribe of the Maasai in, in, in Kenya, and that was a tremendous experience. Uh, and it illustrated to me all the work that must have gone into the recruitment uh, that was, I think, fairly systematically done by more than one team as part of the HatMap project. The, um, no, I was enormously impressed by, by Charles Rotimi's contributions and thinking about the whole thing. There, there was a, a simple and very right philosophy. Uh, and of course, he, he really, of all people, could do this. He, he understood exactly the cultural differences and what could and could not be done. Um, and so I'm delighted at Charles's leadership, which was also was happening at the same time as, as the African Society of Human Genetics was being set up, and Charles was the initial chair or president of, of the African Society, and he invited me out there, in fact, uh, which is how I came to be in Kenya, uh, involved in, 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 in waiting to engage the Maasai. Uh, Charles was there, 
and uh, and uh, so a small team of us were essentially waiting for the call from the local doctor, one Duncan Nagari, uh, who eventually uh, um, uh, drove us out to actually meet uh, the, the, the chief of the tribe to discuss what it was we wanted. Um, and just as you described, um, of course, we, we explained or tried to explain the concepts of what we were doing and of inheritance. And of course, two things emerged from this discussion from a very wise young tribal chief, a remarkable man, um, completely on the ball. Um, but we had some trouble in explaining inheritance. And we talked about things being passed on from generation to generation. And this, this went off in the direction of what, you know, cattle and goods and things that get passed on. No, that's not quite what we meant. Um, but uh, uh, we then got onto the blood. And somehow they understood the concept of things in the blood that get passed on. And they weren't talking about infectious disease. They were talking about patterns from, from, from between generations. And they understood then that we wanted to study this idea of things that get passed on, patterns that get passed on. And they were very interested and excited. They got this because it meant a lot to them. Uh, the, the family ancestry was a very strong element for them. So suddenly we got off onto a, on, onto a common ground, uh, common interest, and, and they absolutely saw why we should be interested in this, and they were delighted to help. And the other very interesting thing that happened was that actually, whether it was Charles or Pat, I don't know, asked if they'd like something in return for their generous gift of permission to engage their, their uh, particular uh, community. One of the very interesting things that they, they we asked them, I think, whether Charles or, or, or Pat asked them, um, did they want anything in return for their generous gift of, uh, uh, of giving us permission to engage the tribe? Uh, and they, he came out with it straight away, the, the chief, uh, HIV testing. And we asked him to expand a bit on that. And he said, because um, we don't have HIV, he said, yet. He said, but we know it's coming. And when it comes, we want to be ready, as ready as we can be. We want to do what we can. And so he was completely in touch with what was happening in other parts of Africa, even though it was a relatively isolated tribe. It was a fascinating exchange. And I asked him afterwards, as we walked across for a celebratory soda in the, in the local soda bar, um, I asked him if he felt, clearly he felt part of his tribe because he was in charge of his tribe. Did he feel part of all the Maasai, the other tribes? And he said, yes. And I said, did he feel part of all of Africa? And he said, yes, all of Africa. And I said, do you feel part of the whole world? He said, no. And that astonished me, because he clearly got way beyond his own boundaries of what he saw on a daily, weekly, monthly basis and his responsibilities to Africa as a, as a whole, as a population. But he said he did not feel the same connection with the rest of the world. And that, of course, was exactly what the HAMAP project was actually uh, seeking to define. Uh, and at that point, I recognized we were really coming from rather different backgrounds, uh, myself and the Maasai chief. I'm yeah, I, 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 I was not involved in the Human Diversity Project at all, and I didn't really know much about it. But I was aware that as the early discussions about the HATMAP project took off, that there was this sensitivity. There was this past history that it was very important to work differently, to fully engage communities. And I think that was very much um, a part of the motivation and the agenda for this very big meeting in, in this hotel here in, in, in Washington, DC, uh, the Renaissance, I think. Uh, where we did have members of many of these communities present to have a voice, to speak out, to, to voice their concerns and their interest. Uh, and clearly that was a very major part of community engagement. And of course, community engagement became a big part of the HAP map, and rightly so. Uh, uh, and, and I think I'm very glad when it was done on so many levels. It was done at the levels of going for, to get uh, samples with the indigenous populations, but using a process of engagement to get them to understand and and then just explore uh, their, their interest in that. Um, so I think the extent to which that may have been presaged by experience from the Human Diversity Project, uh, I think was a very good way of managing the situation. As far as I'm aware, uh, the process was extremely successful. Uh, I don't know the details. It was another group that was doing it. But uh, at the same time, it was certainly good. And certainly, I enjoyed the brief 
passage of community engagement that, that I was involved in with the Maasai. Um, so I wasn't very directly involved in the, in the real uh, definition of the, of the, of the boundaries of, of what's hat mappable and what is not, but it was clear the concept was there were regions that were difficult for one reason or another. Uh, either we weren't finding SNPs in those regions, or there was something intrinsic about the structure of those regions, or there simply wasn't any LD. Uh, there was perhaps more recombination. And put two or three of those components together, and you suddenly get a region that really defies characterization. Not to say it isn't mappable, um, but to say that it would d involve a, uh, a disproportionate investment to get across the region, perhaps. And we did not necessarily have good approaches at the time to target every region of the hat map uh, of the genome to, 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 to ensure that it could be mapped to the same extent. Uh, and so as a result, we had to come up with a definition of, so wh when, when is the project declared done? Um, problem not unlike the human genome in a sense, it was just less easy to define. The human genome is clear. Well, it's done, well, it's done when we've done the euchromatic regions because we know we can't do the heterochromatic regions. So it's done in one sense, it's not done in the sense a cytogeneticist would say, where's the end of that chromosome? Right. Um, particularly the, uh, uh, the, the short arms of the acrocentric chromosomes. There are ribosomal genes up there, but we can't say it's part of a 20 megabase contig or something. Um, so clearly the unsequenceable regions of the human genome can be defined based on a lot of uh, other evidence uh, about structures being different presumably perhaps base composition being different, repetitive sequences. We can see the elements that are in the unsequenceable regions, and of course we can then continue to, to begin to, to work on them, uh, although they take a lot more investment than the rest of the genome. Uh, the value, of course, perhaps considered, particularly for supporting genetics and medicine and much of biology, of course, are in where all the genes are. And hence the euchromatic region emerged as being the, the primary uh, finishing post for the human genome sequence. The same is true of HapMap, but we needed a different finishing post. But the problem was the same. There were regions that defied characterization for somewhat unknown properties. And in this case, of course, in some cases, the properties were less well known because there wasn't so much evidence to say, why was that region different? Why was it not actually being populated with markers? Or, or, or why was there no LD across the regions? Um, perhaps we didn't have the right samples to genotype. Perhaps more, more work could have yielded smaller gaps. Um, but I think, therefore, it's a rather operational endpoint to the project that got defined by a number of things, including the number of SNPs and including the number of samples and the different groups. And changing any one of those parameters would make a difference to the unmapped regions. At the same time, I think we reckon that the, the first approximations to when we sat round a, a table, I think at Cold Spring Harbor, actually, and discussed what the bounds of the project would be, we felt that actually to have essentially 85% of the genome, of 85% of the sequenced genome, 85% of the euchromatic part of the genome, uh, essentially captured in haplotype blocks was a tremendous outcome, was a good endpoint to, to aim for, and that we should then um, direct our strategy to try to cover that, rather than saying we should direct all our effort to the remaining 10 or 15%. It was important to gather the majority. Uh, essentially, the job would not be finished by one measure. This is going right back to the concept of the yeast genome and Maynard. Uh, uh, but even a product with some gaps is a jolly useful product. Look at look at the 85% you have and not the 15% that you don't have. Um, and clearly, when you move to applying the results of such a structure to genetic associations, to, to genome-wide association studies, or whatever it might be, the fact that you only have 85% of the genome means that assuming uh, associations or susceptibility factors are distributed evenly throughout the genome, you will find 85% of them uh, based on the SNPs that you have if you have sufficient power in your studies. So it was a pretty good starting point. Uh, look at what you can achieve uh, as opposed to worrying about the 15% the that you can't get at the moment. Well, I think there were, there, there were two ways to go. Uh, from from that point, I think one was to continue with developing the concept of the hat map and addressing some of the original areas that we'd had to put to put to rest for now to park, uh, which included more SNPs, uh, more populations as well. The more populations question had been there right from the beginning. 
Uh, clearly, we don't know about the level of uh, similarity or real applicability of one set to another until we actually do another population. So I think there was a tremendous opportunity to diversify the populations involved in the study. And we're still only scratching the surface as far as the human population is concerned. Um, but the other way to go, which, which became more of a, a focus for me, uh, was the unanswered question of how good genome-wide association studies really were, could be, could they be better? Um, because there was, there had for some time been um, many, many, many antagonists, pe people who didn't believe that the GWAS program was really going to either identify the right factors or, uh, or the, or the, the um, um, the sites identified in the genome wouldn't necessarily provide insights on, on disease. Uh, and so I think once this comprehensive haplotype map was available with the SNPs to enable it to be applied to, to, to case control studies, um, there was a big unanswered question. Well, now we have the opportunity to, 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 to evaluate once and for all the utility of this approach. And we're either going to prove it or it's going to stop uh, uh, garnering funds for further work. This was a discussion in the UK. Certainly John Bell was involved, Peter Donnelly was involved, uh, and, and the question was, were we really going to mount a program to evaluate for ourselves what the HAP map would bring to, um, to powering GWAS studies rather better? And that really uh, was an interesting transition uh, to becoming a national consortium. Uh, this was the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium started to utilize the HAP map to take advantage of existing case control cohorts in the UK to really start to look for, can we now find associations now that we have a, uh, a HAP map of uh, at least a significant density? Yeah, I wasn't really much involved in the GWAS studies early on. I was fairly compelled by the Factor V Leiden uh, uh, association study with uh, uh, um, deep vein thrombosis and the numbers, the logic seemed to make sense. Um, but clearly as you scaled up, yes, there were shortcomings of some of the studies. Uh, and the HAP map, of course, provided at least reduced the limitations of some of those studies by going truly genome-wide, or at least asking the questions of 85% of the genome uh, in, 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 a, in a fairly well-measured way. Um, so that was a, a positive contribution that the HAP map could make to those studies. And I think it did. I think it stimulated a great many more findings, uh, findings that were statistically strong, uh, developed new ways of actually analyzing the data as a result. Um, and, and clearly a great many targets of the genome have been found in various cohorts. Um, it's still a struggle, I think, for, 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 for two reasons. One is to actually find the variant that is directly associated with the condition. The causal variant is still a leap from, from the association. Um, and the other, of course, is these are common conditions and the multifactorial nature of the program means that even if you found a really strong hit, it's only part of the architecture of a particular disease uh, or, or the cause of the phenotype. And, and there again is another whole complexity to the study of common disease uh, through this kind of approach. Uh, it's a big challenge. I wasn't very much involved in the origination, in, in, the, right. in, in originating it, no. Um, by now I was uh, at Selexa uh, and uh, uh, very much the sequencing technology development and Illumina had, had acquired Selexa as well. So in that sense I was less involved in the actual inception of the project. Um, but certainly some of the unanswered questions of the HAP map and genetic maps and the incompleteness of, of the coverage uh, which had been posed by these projects were clearly once again um, um, being challenged. There was the question now we could really overcome uh, in popula at, at a population scale um, the gaps between SNPs um, and, and to start to, in particular I think the idea of being able to capture every variant in a person's genome uh, completely changed the dynamic between indirect and direct association studies. And the direct association study, you're working with the actual variant that's causing the particular condition. The association signal is going to be much stronger than any indirect association that relies on LD between the causal mutation and, and the actual marker in question. So the idea of having every variant in an individual 
uh, was actually a concept that, that, that I was thinking much more about, um, even than the Thousand Genomes Project. The Thousand Genomes Project sought to sequence individuals, but to accumulate all the variants they could find to make a better resource of variation. Uh, and that already went a lot of the way towards uh, a much, to, to filling the gaps, to really studying variation across every part of the genome, at least, that was covered by sequence. Um, and you could really close the gap between the 85% mappability and the fact that the reference sequence was covering 98, 99% of the euchromatic sequence. So what is in that difference between 85 and 99? Does the Thousand Genomes Project provide those variants? Uh, and I think that was a very important question to, for the Thousand Genomes Project to, to answer. Yeah.